Today we're going to talk about a couple different aspects of the internet and computer networks. Cookies and the cloud. These two things actually don't have a whole lot to do with each other. We're just going to bundle them into one video. I guess what they have in common is they are involved in the internet. So first let's talk about cookies. Let's look at a basic diagram again of a browser connecting to a web server. Here we see again a basic diagram of how the web works. A browser software is installed on a user's computer. There's a web server out on the internet for a specific website. The browser issues a request to the website. The web server for that site finds the applicable files, sends them back as a response. Basic process, and we've looked at that a few different times. Now, one thing to cover about how the web works, about the, the, the internet works as well, is a concept of what's called state. One of the regular definitions of the word state essentially is the condition of a thing at any point in time. That's actually the definition that's at play when we talk about the web. And here's what I mean specifically. When the browser requests a web page, what that web page is, in its essence, is a static file. There is a .html file, as we've covered before, that HTML, when sent back to the browser, can be used to create the displayed web page. But here's the thing. Each time a browser asks for that web page and the web page gets sent back, happens all by itself in a specific unit of time. If you request a web page and then five minutes later request that web page again, the fact that you requested it five minutes before isn't a known piece of data. In addition, this website usually is not something that's just used as a glorified brochure site with static pictures. There's some usability to it. It needs certain information about the user. What's their account number? What type of a user are they? Are there any particular services or products that the website represents that they have considered popular or they're interested in or that they have purchased before? Now, those are things that change over time. The state of those properties, if you will, is not necessarily the same all the time. Let's just take a real basic one. What if you wanted to know whether or not someone who visited your website had actually ever bought anything from you? If your website was something where they could buy. Now, there's a few different things that matter there that involve state or the condition of a thing. One would be, who's the person? In other words, what's their username? What's their password? How do you uniquely identify that that is that person? And how do you identify that they are actually an active, allowed, authorized user of your account? So that's a piece of data to which state would apply. Are they in fact an active member of your account on your website at any point in time? Then there's the one of, have they ever bought anything? Here, active means are they allowed to buy? Have they ever bought is, have they ever bought anything from you? So these elements are considered state elements. So let's pretend we didn't have a way to store this information at all. And Bob logs onto your website where he can buy canoes. And he peruses the canoes and eventually buys one. Now, a day later, Bob logs onto your website and is perusing the canoes. Let's say that you internally would like to offer him a discount if he's a current customer. How do you know he is? That speaks to state, the condition of a thing at any point in time. His condition now on day two is different at the beginning of day one because on day one he hadn't bought anything, on day two he has. So that data needs to be stored somewhere. And there are a few different solutions. One of them, and this brings us around to the idea of a cookie, is this. What if the first time Bob orders a canoe off of your site, along with the response, you send a small file, and this file can get stored on Bob's computer, and it records who the user is, the fact that it's Bob, and the fact that he has, in fact, bought something from you. 
the next time Bob visits your website, Bob's browser will issue a request, hey, show me those pictures of canoes. The web server can send a response back to the browser that says, all right, I'd like to do that. I really would. But first, can you check to see if you have a file from my web server? And if you do have that file, can you check to see whether it indicates whether Bob has bought anything or not? That information will be found on the person's computer and sent back to the web server. Now the web server knows to change the content of the web page and send back a page where part of it says to Bob, congratulations, as an existing customer, you're authorized 150% discount. We'll pay you to shop. Well, probably wouldn't do that or they lose money. But you get the idea. They would be able to change the data sent back to the browser based on the state of that user. And the state here is, have they bought or not? The file that's sent from the web browser to be stored on the individual's computer is called a cookie. Some of you may know this data already. Some of you may have seen the word cookie referred to on different websites. For some of you, this may be completely new. A cookie is essentially a file that can be stored on the browser's computer to store data that a web server would need about certain state information. Now, what kind of things would you want to save in a cookie? What kind of things would you want in this file? Well, it varies wildly. It totally depends on what the purpose of the website is, what the users are using it for. But typical things might be if you are browsing an online catalog of clothing, the cookie might save a history of every item that you've looked at before so that when you log on to that website again, it could have a little spot at the bottom that says previously viewed items, for example. The possibilities are endless. In fact, the creator of the website itself is the person who programs what data is going to be in that file because they're the one that needs it. Now let's add a little bit of complication to this and discuss a concept called a third party cookie. If you think about the primary way this works, you have two parties involved. You have the user, Bob, and you have the website he's going to. This is his primary site that he goes to. Just for the purposes of this, this illustration, Bob happens to be visiting canoes.com. This is two people, two parties, if you will. Let's see how we can add a third party in. Let's say that the website kayaks.com has learned that it's really smart to find out who visits canoes.com because people buy canoes by kayaks. And they work an arrangement out with canoes.com that when Bob visits canoes.com, canoes.com sends two cookies onto Bob's computer. One is the canoes.com cookie, used for whatever it needs to for its own internal operation, keep track of canoes he's browsed, whatever, right? The other one is actually a cookie for kayaks.com. And that cookie contains code that will let kayaks.com know that Bob browsed. Now, let's move it a little forward, farther forward. Let's say there's another website, bicycles.com. And Bob visits bicycles.com. It's like, okay, cool. I want to check out some bicycles. And let's say kayaks.com has also clued into the fact that it's really smart to know who shops at bicycles.com because they like to buy kayaks. And so they do the same thing. They say, hey, listen, in addition to your own cookie, can you put a kayak cookie on the computer of people that visit you. And so Bob visits bicycles.com and sure enough, two cookies get installed on his machine. The bicycles.com and another kayak.com cookie. Now, this cookie also reports to kayaks.com, hey, this guy Bob, he's been on two affiliated websites. Now they're gonna do with that whatever they want. If they're using it for marketing purposes, they'll probably try to find a way to identify Bob, or at least his computer, and get their advertisements over to him. Because again, 
they might think it's likely that people buy canoes or bicycles might buy kayaks. Again, this is called a third party cookie because the primary two parties involved, there's a third one that comes in. Primary parties at first are Bob and his computer and canoes.com, two different parties. Second time around, Bob's computer and bicycles.com, two different parties. A third party he never visits has worked out an arrangement to get their cookie onto his computer twice each time they visit an affiliated web server that, that kayaks.com has set up a, an arrangement with. That's a third party cookie.